survival of consciousness. It's about as close of a matter of life and death as, as we can imagine. And the way it's going to work is I'm going to, I'll talk for about an hour and a half and we'll have a break or two in, in the interim, which will give you a, a fast overview of the kinds of evidence for survival that there is. Uh, any one class of, of the topics that we're talking about could easily be a workshop or two or a college semester in itself. So we're really getting an overview. Uh, one of the things I won't talk about in any in much detail is mediumship because that's Julie's specialty. Uh, and we also have a medium here who will uh, take up most of the afternoon. So you're going to get uh, some intellectual data dumping from me and then some from Julie, and then have an experience in the afternoon about how mediums actually work. And I think uh, I, I think you'll all get a chance to ask a question. Is that not right, Dave? Yeah, I'll be able to participate in asking at least one question, if not more. So Julie insisted that I put in this slide because uh, parapsychology traditionally is involved with four areas of uh, the big four phenomena, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and psychokinesis, and in present time, at least, only an occasional nod toward survival. And this is a flip-flop historically because in, the, in historical terms, this area started as a result of people's interest in survival th through things like apparitions and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it came apparent within probably the first 10 years of doing research of that type in, late, in the late 1800s that in order to know what's actually happening in people's experience, you need to know, for example, if a medium tells you something, where did the information come from? Well, the first thing you need to find out is whether or not it's possible to have telepathy with the client because the client has to know the information in order to verify it. So this led towards telepathy research, which led towards clairvoyance research, and then precognition, and psychokinesis came a little bit later. So most modern parapsychology is in the laboratory looking at the big four, and a few people in the world are doing what Julie is doing, which is studying mediumship directly and other survival phenomena. So we're in the process of putting together a very complicated jigsaw puzzle. Um, we don't have all the pieces yet. We can kind of see a shape that's forming, but there's an awful lot that we don't really know yet. So they have to say that up front because we don't have solid answers to hardly anything except maybe one. So as I said, we'll talk about categories of evidence, a little bit about some of the evidence, and then the demonstration of mediumship. And there's a whole bunch of caveats which could take up another eight hours to talk about. So I'm just going to mention them and not going into it in any great detail. The first thing is that any time you're dealing with eyewitness testimony and reports of experience, you know that there's some kind of distortion happening. There's, there are whole classes of academic psychology which specialize in illusions and delusions and how we fool ourselves and why anecdotes are not that good for evidence. On the other hand, all we actually have are anecdotes. You know, we have our personal experience, and so we have to be careful about how we interpret our experiences uh, and, but ultimately, that's the raw data that we have. And then the, the last thing there is psi versus super psi. And this comes about because since there's been so much laboratory research done on psi phenomena, clairvoyance and so on, we have very high confidence that these things are real. So if a medium, for example, says uh, your, your dead aunt Martha is telling you such and such, we know that in the living, living people can get information of that type. So it's not entirely clear that there's really dead Aunt Martha giving information. So the super psi hypothesis is that any form of evidence for survival can be explained, sometimes circuitously, but it can be explained as psi in the living. Because we don't have psi in the dead yet. We don't have any way of directly testing that. And the name medium came about as the medium between the living and the dead but the medium is alive. So this is the problem that we keep bumping into. And one of the challenges then is to find evidence from any of the classes of survival that look like it would not be super psi. Super psi is simply meaning a, a, a very advanced form of psychic ability. So Julie will talk about that as a part of the experimental approach then, is to find ways of making it more parsimonious to imagine that the information is coming from dead people than coming from the living.
And I think there, there, there are inklings of evidence like that. And I'll mention one of them, and Julie will mention many more. Dog bark. This is, uh, th this is just an example of, I'm going to show a few illusions here. Uh, this one, when you scan it, it looks like parts of it are moving. This is a, called the rotating snake illusion. Uh, just one of many, many ways of illustrating that sometimes what we see is not actually what's there. Of course, there isn't anything moving in this. Do, do you see the apparent movement? So the reason why there's apparent movement is because of the way that the black bars are in here. It just happens that because of the way of our visual apparatus works when our eyes are scanning on something that when you see black bars, it tricks your eye into thinking that it's something is moving in a particular direction. And there are many, many variations on that. This is a very interesting one. This won a prize. There's a, an international competition on illusions, on visual illusions, and this won a prize a few years ago. This is exactly the same person. The, one of them looks female and one looks male. Most people see the left as female and the right as male. And the only difference between the two is that this one, the, the one on the left, has slightly higher contrast. If you take a, you know, like Photoshop or something and you increase the contrast, uh, it makes it look, the face look female as opposed to, the, to male. And one of the reasons is that female faces tend to have uh, more contrast in the lips and in the eyes and less contrast in the nose, a different shaped nose typically. So a very minor change in the same picture will, will create a male or a female. This looks like an elephant until you realize that it's actually a painted hand. This is an artist that specializes in creating illusions, mostly animal illusions, with his hand. And here's uh, an impossible Russian vehicle. All right, so the essential question is this one. Does the brain equal the mind and or consciousness? If the brain does equal the mind, then survival seems unlikely because when your brain dies, it goes away real quick, and so there's nothing left. But if the brain does not equal the mind, then we can legitimately ask what survives. If the brain is something like a transceiver and there's, there's mind everywhere and it expresses itself through us, and the reason why it expresses it differently in me than in you is because my brain is different than yours. I have a different physical structure through which consciousness is somehow expressing itself. If that is the case, and I actually believe that the evidence is beginning to point that that is what's going on, that we're, we're in a medium of consciousness and our bodies make it appear differently. But then it raises the question of, well, what is that stuff? What is that medium out there that we call consciousness, the, the stuff of consciousness? Nobody actually knows, but it, it allows us to at least ask the question. And also, what, is, what does it mean to survive? If the primordial ground is consciousness, it was always here. It, it, it's, not, it's not even a question that it's going to survive. The only thing that's a question is, is it my personality going to survive? And if my personality is part of my physical structure in my brain, then maybe my personality doesn't survive. What kind of reality is required for survival? This is another question asking of what is the nature of the medium in which we actually reside? What's, what's reality? I'm going to talk about that more in my plenary talk tomorrow or Friday. The assumptions about reality that have been developed by modern science are basically these. Reductionism, determinism, mechanism, materialism. All of that says basically that we live in a clockwork universe, a mechanistic material clockwork universe, and that's the way it is. In that universe, nothing survives because when, as the brain thought of as a material clockwork object, when that object dies, there's nothing left. Other models are the ones that I mentioned. And basically, the, a way of thinking about this other model where consciousness is at, at a fundamental level and everything emerges from that is from the Vedantic uh, model, which is Atman equals Brahman that the, the soul, the individual mind, is the same as the universal mind. It's just a smaller version of it. Recommended books. 
Um, David Fontana's book is probably the single best book for reviewing the different classes of evidence, and I've used that book uh, in my talk here. Irreducible Mind is, this is a big fat book. This is a much bigger and much fatter book. Uh, Irreducible Mind is written by, is written in a scholarly way. It goes into great, great detail about the, uh, the evidence that says that mind is not material. I mean, it basically is a very strong counter argument to academic psychology today and the, and the neurosciences and provides lots of reasons, some of which I'll go over, about why the idea of a, of a clockwork universe and a mechanistic brain is probably wrong. And then Entangled Minds is my book on psi phenomena. Charlie Tart just came out with a book called The End of Materialism, which is uh, basically his rationale for why uh, he was one of the co-founders for transpersonal psychology. And it, again, it is questioning the prevailing attitude within the academic world, especially the neurosciences, that says well, maybe the idea of a mechanistic material brain is not the same as mind. And so he provides a lot of evidence for that as well. Evidence. We'll talk a little bit about mind-body phenomena that don't fit the classical view. Things like geniuses and savants, multiple personality, mystical experience, psychic phenomena, all of this is like in a class of exceptional human experience. These other classes are much more uh, attuned to the idea of survival, apparitions, hauntings, mental mediumship, physical mediumship, electronic voice phenomena, and instrumental transcommunication. Is that right? In ITC, yeah. Near-death experience, out-of-body experience, and reincarnation. So a mind-body phenomena. My wife is a yogini. She does yoga. This is not my wife. <laughs> but she could probably do that. Uh, it's amazing to me that anybody can do that and not have to have an ambulance come and take them away. <laughs> but for those of you who know how to do this, you know, it's, it really is astonishing what, what the mind and body can do. So one class covered by, uh, in the book, Irreducible Mind, are hypnotic phenomena. And for people who are good hypnotic subjects, roughly one in a hundred, you can do uh, absolutely incredible things, like full anesthesia for a specific area of your body. Some people, for example, when having a tooth extracted, don't need any medication at all. They just need a couple of minutes of hypnosis. To me, that sounds crazy, and yet it works. And by the same token, for the right kind of deep trance subject, you can poke them with your finger and tell them it's a hot poker and they'll get a blister. And you could even reverse that. You can tell them that I'm going to give you a magic potion which is going to make the blister go away and it will go away extremely fast. So the connection between mind and body when it's a very deep connection can produce really amazing things. Multiple personality. Uh, we know that there are cases where people have, are multiples, but the part of it which is most interesting is that sometimes a multiple will be allergic to cats, for example, and yet another multiple won't. And the switch between the allergic reaction is so fast that it can't really be accounted for very well by the body as a mechanistic thing. I mean, we're talking about matters of 30 seconds or so between being allergic to very allergic to cats and having no allergy at all. There are probably about 100 cases now known where people are apparently normal and have normal IQs and they don't have any brain. And what I mean by that is that when they, you do an MRI of the brain itself, you don't see the structure of the brain. What you, what you see is that the, typically because of a hydrocephalic case where fluid in the brain, fluid in the cerebrospinal fluid has leaked into the brain, it has squashed the brain so it's about a millimeter thick inside the, the cranium. And these people are normal. You couldn't tell by talking to them or any, any other reason that they have this. And in fact, in most cases, the people without brains found out that they don't have a brain because they had a headache one day. And they go to see the doctor and the doctor can't figure out why, so they get an MRI or an X-ray and they discover all they have in their head is fluid. So the reason why it is thought that, I mean, obviously, if you have a traumatic brain injury, you're going to have a pretty big change in your behavior. But if this happens over a slow period of time where you have a leak into the brain and the pressure begins, to, the fluid pushes the brain away, 
it shows that the brain is so plastic that you can have normal functioning and, st and yet have a brain which is a millimeter thick and only on the outside of your cranium. So we, we hardly know anything really about brain structure. And especially for in the neurosciences, there's an enormous amount of attention paid in the in neuroanatomy on the various structures of the brain. And yet the same structures are probably working when you have a very flat brain, a thin, flat brain, except no one knows how it can do that. So there's a big mystery there. Postponement of death is a, a well-known phenomena that if uh, somebody wished to remain alive until their birthday or some important day, they can do that. And then after that day, they die. So will apparently is able to overcome the body's uh, failing. Breatharians are people who claim that they don't eat or drink ever. Uh, I've met a few people who claim that, and they look awfully robust to me. Uh, for people I know who stop eating for a while, they start looking like skeletons. These people claim that they do something different. They claim that they meditate a lot, and they spend a lot of time in nature, barefoot on the ground and in the sun and so on, and they absorb nutrients, they claim, so that they don't need to actually eat anything, that the body transmutes the energy of the world into the nutrients that they need. Uh, yes. So the question is, are, have any experiments been done to verify these cases? Uh, the best case that I know of, actually, there was a documentary made, a private documentary made on this, which is not released yet, but it, I hope someday it will be. And I've seen the, the documentary. Let's get the picture back. Um, this is a case of a yogi who claimed that when he was a, a young boy uh, that one of the many Hindu gods appeared to him, I forget which one, and said that uh, if he devoted his life to this goddess, actually, that he would no longer need to eat. So he was a kid. What did he know? So he decided, okay, that seems like a good thing. And the story then is for the last 70 years he hasn't eaten or drank anything. And he... No water, no food, nothing. So th this is a story, and you can find these stories in India, and mostly in India, but other places in the world as well. And so uh, he, uh, some of his disciples said, we, we think this is a miracle, so let's test it. So they went to a hospital in India uh, where most of the doctors were Western trained. And the interviews with the doctors in this film show beforehand, they said, well, this is ridiculous. He's, he's going to die, and we're not going to let him die on our watch. So we will keep him under 24-hour super, supervision and videotape with multiple videos and multiple people around to make sure he's not eating or drinking. And we'll do continual medical tests to make sure that his kidneys aren't failing and so on. And they all said that the, their training said that this was impossible. Even though there's within the, the Indian culture, they, they're Western trained and they didn't believe it. So uh, they, they do. They did the 10 days of testing, and he was in meditation most of the time. And he didn't, not only did he not lose any weight, in their uh, ultra, ultra scan of his bladder, his bladder actually would fill up with fluid and then empty. And he wasn't peeing and he wasn't going to the toilet through this whole time. And it's uh, the first case that I know of where there were not only 24-hour supervision to make sure he wasn't somehow sneaking food from somewhere, but that the medical tests were consistent with the idea that somehow he was completely stable. That, but nevertheless, the same 24-hour rhythms that you'd expect in our bodies was being expressed in his. And so, like, the body was somehow recycling the, uh, itself in some bizarre way that we don't understand. So that was done by... a an Austrian filmmaker, and uh, I've been working with him to, he wanted my assessment of what was going on, and I, of course I needed to see what the film footage was, and the movie's not out yet, but hopefully it will be soon. So I'd, I'd say of the cases I know, there's maybe one case like that one that really caught my attention. And most of the other cases, you really can't know. You don't know whether they, what they mean by not eating doesn't include brownies. Or, you know, like a hamburger every other day, that's, that's not really food. I, I don't know. <clears throat> We're probably all aware of cases of exceptional healing where somebody has a massive tumor one day and then they claim that a saint appears in their dreams and the next day they don't have it. 
well, that's impossible. The body can't get rid of things that quickly, and yet there are a number of cases like that. The ones that are best documented are the ones from Lourdes, because in the 60 or so cases from Lourdes, there were, these were cases where the Catholic Church absolutely did not want to accept something that wasn't considered a medical miracle. And of the thousands and thousands of people who have gone to Lourdes, about 60 cases are seen where you have the equivalent of a tumor disappearing overnight. So there are cases like that. And then geniuses and savants. The interesting thing about genius and savants is that while everybody can agree that they exist, from a neuroscience point of view, no one has any idea at all how a genius or especially a savant can do what they do. So here's the Lourdes Cosmetic Surgery Chapel. This person saying, Holy Spirit, everything is sagging. I beseech thee. This one says, my hairline and I come to you, O divine one, in our time of need. And this lady says, help me find it the way to a more attractive profile, and I will be thy eternal servant. <laughs> Here's a case of lightning calculation, which is just one example of a savant. So a lot of times the savants are autistic, and they don't really function very well, but this is an exception. In Germany lives a misfit named Rudiger Gam. His brain is a portal into the infinite world of numbers. People call me the human calculator because... I'm able to calculate better than a normal pocket calculator. And he processes information at lightning speed. One, six, eight, nine, nine. But the Iceman is not the only superhuman. Another hero has emerged in Germany. Rudiger Gam, a man with outstanding mental agility. Rudiger can do complex arithmetic in the blink of an eye. I will now try to divide a relatively low prime number, 109, into a two-digit number. I will attempt to go 100 digits after the decimal point, so I need a two-digit number from the audience. 93. 93 divided by 109. Null, Komma, Acht, Fünf, Drei, Zwei, Eins, Eins, Null, Null, Neun, Eins, Sieben, Vier, Drei, Eins, Eins, Neun, Zwei, Sechs, Sechs, Null, Fünf, Fünf, Null, Vier, Fünf, Acht, Sieben, Eins, Fünf, Fünf, Neun, Sechs, Drei, Null, Zwei, Sieben, Fünf, Zwei, Drei, Null, Drei, Fünf, Sieben, Sieben, Neun, Acht, Eins, Sechs, Fünf, Eins, Zwei, Sieben, Sechs, Eins, Vier, Sechs, Sieben, Acht, Acht, Neun, 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 Acht, Zwei, Fünf, Sechs, Acht, Acht, Null, Sieben, Drei, Drei, Neun, Vier, Vier, Neun, Fünf, Vier, Eins, Zwei, Acht, Vier, Null, Drei, Sechs, Sechs, Neun, Sieben, Drei, Vier, Sieben, Sieben, Null, Sechs, Vier, Zwei, Zwei, Null, Eins, Acht, Zwei, Vier, Acht, Sechs, Zwei, Drei. The crowds weren't always so impressed with Rudiger Gam. As a child, friends were hard to come by. I had no normal childhood. I think the other children were a little bit afraid of me because before I started speaking forwards, I started speaking backwards. For example, this is forward. I was very bad in math, backwards, same knee, that you have, so yeah. And when the tape is played in reverse, the words are perfectly clear. I was very bad in math. And to this day, the people of Veltsheim still find him as odd as an adult, as they did when he was a little boy. People think of him as being the next antichrist the guy who has a pact with the devil. I'm just very happy. We live in a time where you don't end up being burned at the stake for being someone with special talents. Some people called me the devil because of my ability to speak backwards. Some people are afraid of me. Many people think he's, he's crazy, he's, he's not normal. Part of a series uh, from Discovery showed about uh, people with supposedly supernormal abilities. And in this case, it has a kind of is supernormal. I mean, it, he has an amazing ability to to do calculation that um, is actually almost faster than you can do with a calculator. If you're given a, a, a instruction to do like get pi to 200 places, and you have to calculate that, he can be rattling off the digits to as long as you ever wish, and just keep going. 
So we don't have, we don't have any idea how that's even possible. Mysticism, the, the classic experience of feeling unity with the universe, is another major mystery. These are things that are not accounted for very well by neuroscience, unless you pay attention maybe to uh, Joel Bolt Taylor, who wrote this book, uh, My Stroke of Insight, in which case she was forced to be in her right brain for a while, and she describes it as a mystical experience. That can give the a kind of a gloss to the idea that maybe mystical experience is really just a brain effect, but I don't think so. My, mystical experience and esotericism in general are pretty closely aligned with each other. Esotericism is a kind of Western view of Eastern philosophy, to put it in a very cartoon version. Uh, a lot of psychedelic experiences are not very well understood either, and to not, both in terms of the biochemistry and also in terms of the experiences that go on in these states. Some people think that uh, the pineal gland, which is an endogenous source of DMP, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, uh, is a reason why we're so susceptible to psychedelics, because we have it in our body anyway. And, of course, there's a perennial philosophy, which is, in, in essence, the Atman equals Brahman idea, that our individual minds are part of some grand mind. As Aldux, whoop. The projector doesn't like it. It's blinking power and it's blinking warning. I don't know whether that means we should leave the room or whether the, the bulb has, has gone. Yeah. Tell someone that they're, they're either in an impending explosion or it's, it's, um, or the lamp is going. <laughs>